Hey, I'm John. I'm a pastor here at Heartland. We're so excited that you're joining us today as we get ready to jump into an incredible time of worship. We're going to continue our series about the promises of God. Isn't it incredible that in a world of broken promises that we serve a God that can be counted on? Uh, we would love it at any point during our service today. If you have a prayer request, a need, just something that you would love to share with us, our leadership team, our pastors here at Heartland, we would love it if you would connect with us and just email us at pastorphil at hcc3d.com. We would love to be praying with you just throughout the week, no matter what it is. Again, at any point, you're going to hear some things as we're, as we're talking today in our message. God's doing some incredible things in our communities. Whether you're here at our Valpo campus, North Judson, Wanata, or any of our other locations, or you know what, our world missions, United States, internationally, we would just invite you, join us in, in what God's doing. There's a giving button if you go to hcc.ag, a little giving tab, just join us in what God's doing. He's going to do incredible things, not just through you, but in you. We're getting ready to jump into our message today. Just join us as we get ready to worship God and how awesome he is. Come on, our promise is in Deuteronomy chapter 11, 13, and 18 today. It says, so if you faithfully obey the commands I am giving you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then... I will send rain on your land in its season, both autumn and spring rain, so that you may gather in your grain new wine and olive oil. I will provide grass in the fields for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. Be careful, or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you, and he will shut up the heavens so that it will not rain on the ground. And the ground will yield no pr produce, and you will soon perish from the good land the Lord has given you. Fix these words of mine on your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbol as your hands and bind them on your foreheads. How many of you are glad that we serve a God of miracles this morning? Come on, how many of you are glad that we serve a God who is able to do what we ask and what we pray? But listen, sometimes it is hard to believe that promise when you're standing in the middle. So come on, all over this hand, all over this place, can we lift our hands? And come on, can we sing this song one more time? Come on, in all of our locations, all online. Come on, declare this. Even though you're in the middle today, I want you to declare this. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see. I'm going to see a victory. Come on, sing it for the battle. The battle is yours, Lord. Come on, one more time. I'm going to see a victory. Come on, one more time. Can you declare that over your life today? Come on, say it. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Come on, as you stand there, God, thank you this morning adjusting our perspective God Lord that as we stand this morning as we're here this morning God you're about to adjust not what we see God not our circumstances but God you're about to adjust and put it in perspective God who you are and whose you say that we are so God at all of our locations God today you have your way in our life God challenge and change us with your word today in Jesus mighty name amen and amen come on can we give Jesus a big hand clap of praise if you're glad of that. Hey, before you sit down, it may not mean nothing to you yet, but I want you to tap about three people on the shoulder and tell them, say, don't stop in the middle. Come on, tell them. Don't stop at all of our locations. Come on, tell them like you mean it. Don't stop in the middle. You're like, what does that even mean? It'll mean something to you in a minute. Don't stop in the middle. I want to welcome all of you watching online. I want to welcome North Judson East, NPH, Westville, 
all of you watching all across the country and the world. Come on, can we put our hands together and welcome our I campuses this morning? Come on, make some noise for them. They can hear you. Here at Valpo, welcome our guests and all of our family. Good to see you today. And we're going to continue our series on the, on the promises uh, this, this morning. And as Pastor Phil said, I can't believe five more Sundays in 2019. It's gone. Cannot believe that. But as we've been looking over this past year, we've been unpacking the promises of God, right? We've been looking at what God says about our circumstances and what God says about our situations and what God says about who we are, right? It's so easy to, to let life determine what we see and it's so easy to, to let life determine our perspective. But I've, I've really loved this series this past year as we've been looking at God's promises. I'm excited for 2020 about great prayers, man, just asking big things of God, right? Making your ask bigger, A-S-K, don't get nervous, making your ask bigger. I want to make a shirt. I don't know if this is good or not that says I go to the big ask church. That would be a good shirt, right? Uh, I'll sell them. I'll sell them to you. We'll, we'll get them made. Pastor Phil may not let it, but I'm gonna, we'll have like, a, like one of those dudes in the parking lot in the trunk of my car. You can come get one of those shirts, right? <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 11. Y'all are like, why do they give him the microphone? I don't know either sometimes. Deuteronomy chapter 11 is our promise today. And uh, we're going to look at some things. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Bible or not. Deuteronomy is in the Old Testament. It's the fifth uh, book of the Old Testament. If you've got your Bibles, you can open them up there. The worship guide is there. If you don't have a Bible, you've got a smart device. There's this free app called Uversion. You can download that and have your Bible on your tablet or your phone as well. Uh, but the, the book Deuteronomy, it's literally translated, if you study it out, if I can give you some context this morning of what we're going to look at, it's literally translated uh, to, to that word. It means second law, deuteros pneumos, meaning second law law. And uh, Deuteronomy, it's the, it's the fifth book of the Old Testament. And really, if you begin to, to read Deuteronomy, it's really the farewell address from Moses to the nation of Israel. And now what we know as we study and as we read our Bible, we know that Moses was God's appointed man. Moses was the one who led Israel out of slavery. Israel was a nation. It was God's chosen people. They were in slavery in this place called Egypt for a while, and they had been there for a while, and God raises up Moses as a prophet, and he raises up Moses, and he says, Moses, you're going to be the man to lead my nation, to lead my people out of slavery into this promised land, this land that I've been promising ever since Abraham, who was, a, who was an Old Testament OG. He goes back to the very beginning. He says, you're going to lead my people uh, out of Egypt into the promised land. And so Moses has been leading the nation of Israel. He's, he's been their, their leader, but, but we know as we read, we know that Moses is not going to see the promised land because of some disobedient issues that he had in his life. There's about to be an exchange of guard. Joshua is not about is now about to become the leader, and Moses is going to kind of fade off into the scenes. And so Deuteronomy is kind of like his farewell address. This is like his final goodbye to the nation of Israel. And really when you read it, Deuteronomy is above all, it's, 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 a, it's a book, it's a reiteration of the laws that, that God has given the nation of Israel. He's, he's reiterating to them, listen, you are my people, and this is why you are my people, and I am your God, and this is why I am your God. And, and really, as you begin to read through Deuteronomy, it's ultimately a reminder. It's a reminder to them that, that listen, you've come out of Egypt, right? You're no longer in slavery. You're no longer in bondage. And yet in Deuteronomy, they're not in Egypt anymore, but yet they still not have inherited the promised land. Right. They find themselves in the middle. Yeah. It's not as bad as it used to be, but it's not as good as it can be. Right. You ever been there before? In the middle. And this promised land, it's, it's going to be a great place, the land of Canaan, right? It's a promised land because God has promised it to Israel, but, it, but it's also not just the promised land. It's going to be the land of promises because it is going to be in this land that God would fulfill Many of his promises relating to his, the great gift of salvation, it's going to be in this land that, that Israel would be the stage on which the great drama of, re, 
of redemption would, would be enacted. It would be on this land that the Savior would be born and, and live. And, and there he would die for the sins of the world. It's going to happen in this land. And it's going to be in this land that his people then would begin to spread all across nations and the world to what we know of today and create this movement called Christianity spreading this message of salvation. And so Moses, he, he writes these words, he pens these words as he's addressing the nation of Israel. But he, I think he speaks to us today of, of what it looks like when you're in the middle. Not as bad as what it used to be, but not as good as what it could be, right? I don't, I don't know, any, anybody ever played tennis before? Any tennis players in the house? Anybody? A couple of you? The men don't want to say if you've ever played tennis. Listen, it's okay if you've played tennis. It's not a, it's not a bad sport. I've, I, I never played tennis competitively. I, w I was more of a basketball guy, and I rocked the marching band. That's what kind of man I was. And, uh, but for a minute in my life, a couple of buddies of mine, we started playing tennis just for fun. It's, it's actually a great cardio workout. And uh, so, so we would play for a little bit. But when I moved to South Alabama, uh, I, I met this gentleman his name was Randy. We went to the same church. Church. Randy was a bass player on the worship team that, that we attended and we pastored. I played drums. and So Randy was, was an older gentleman, like late 40s, early, early 50s at that time to me older. As I'm getting older in my life, I realized he wasn't that old at all. Um, so, so, but, but Randy was like late 40s, early 50s. I was 18, 19, right out of high school. And, and Randy had all daughters. And his daughters had, had boyfriends, but none of the boyfriends were like athletic. They were more of like the country dudes that like shot deer and like fish all the time and shot guns, which I love doing that too. But they didn't do any, anything athletic. So as Randy and I started hanging out and started talking about sports, he's like, oh, cool. He's like, you ever play tennis? And I'm like, I mean, with my buddies and all, like for fun. He's like, we should go play tennis sometime. I failed to realize what Randy did not tell me is he was a former Division I NCAA tennis player and really just wanted to serve the ball as hard as he can at my face to see what I would do. I, did, I realize now what Randy wanted to do. And uh, I'll never forget the first time we ever went out and he served the ball. I don't get scared very often in sports. I was scared for my life. I've never seen a tennis ball move like that. And, uh, but Randy began to like, teach me the game a little bit, right? I struggled like hitting the ball back. Maybe it was because I was flinching the whole time. I don't know. But I couldn't hit the ball back or anything. But this is what he pointed out to me. He said, you cannot play tennis very well, he goes, because you find yourself in the middle of the court all the time. And I was like, well, I don't know. I mean, I, like, maybe, like, I thought this is where you're supposed to be. He goes, no, no, not really. He showed me. Here's a picture of the court. He said, he said a good tennis player understands one of two things. You either got to rush the net and, like, get ready for the return right off the hit. He says, or you got to stay back where that white line is at the bottom of the screen. He says, you got to stay back there and be able to get the ball off the bounce. Now, watch this. He said, because you find yourself stuck in the middle, you're not able to react and do exactly what you can do because you're in a place you should not be. All right. yeah. wow. Stay with me this morning. I did not realize there was a spiritual implication to tennis. Because we often find ourselves doing the same thing. We find ourselves being in a place where we are in the middle. We, we cannot attack maybe the way God has called us to attack because we're not rushing. We cannot respond the way that God has called us to respond because we're not far enough back. And we find ourselves in the, in, in the, in the position, we find ourselves in the middle that we, that we cannot do what God has designed us to do because we find ourselves just stopping in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Having no movement in our, our life. And, and what Moses was saying to the nation of Israel in this passage in Deuteronomy, what Moses is speaking to us today is don't stop in the middle. Don't, don't be in that place. And maybe you've come here today and you, and you find yourself, you're, you're in the middle emotionally. Well, it's not as bad as what it used to be, but it's not as good as what it can be. You find yourself in the middle relationally. I, 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 my relationships aren't as bad as what they used to be, but are they as good as what God intended it to be? You find yourself in the middle financially, spiritually, when it comes to having an impact on your life. I don't know what it is, but you find yourself in the middle, and Moses is saying to you and I today, the Holy Spirit is saying to you and I today, don't stop in the middle. And it's in the middle, though, it's in this moment, it's where pivotal decisions are made. 
That's what Randy taught me. He says, it's when you get in the middle. He said, because you get to the place where you, you have to make a decision. Am I going to rush the net or am I going to fall back and be able to catch it off the bounce? And it's in those moments in our life in the middle that there's always a choice. There's always a choice. And, and, and really the choice is just simply one or two things. And you can jot this down. It may not be in your notes, but I'm going to give them to you. Really the difference is between, it's either between being content or being complacent. That's my two choices I have. Content and complacent. Well, aren't they both the same? Well, they, they, they're close, but they're very different. It's in the middle that we find ourselves, that we can be content, we can be complacent. But I think what the Holy Spirit wants us to do this morning is stay committed to what he's called us to do. Because being content can get us in trouble. Because look, I'm, I'm, or being complacent can get us in trouble. I'm going to show you the difference between the two words. Will you stay with me for a second? Watch this. Content means this. It's the state of being contented. It's the state of being satisfied. It's ease of mind. Peace of mind. Mental or emotional satisfaction while having a desire for more. That's content. I can be in the middle and have peace and yet still have a desire for more. But then watch, here's the scary place. Here's the place that we find ourselves. Here's complacent. Watch, watch what looking complacent looks like. Here's the definition of that. It's pleased. That sounds a lot like content. It's being satisfied. Well, that sounds a lot like being content, especially with one's self or one's marriage, advantages or situation. Watch, here's the difference though. Often without awareness of some potential danger or defect. When I'm in the middle, Paul said it like this. He says, I know how in my life, the apostle Paul wrote in Philippians, he said, I know how in my life to be content. In whatever situation I'm in, I can be content. I can have peace. I can, have, I can be at ease of mind. He said, I can be content wherever I'm at. But he also wrote this, but yet, even though I'm content, I press on towards the goal that God has set before me. I can be in a place where I know God has me and yet still desire for more. All right, yeah. That's the difference. And I know you say, but, but, but they're really both the same. No, no, they're watch. They're, they're, they're really not because, because both have to do with being satisfied. Both emotions, content and complacent, has to do with being satif satisfied. But it's the reaction that takes place in that moment that makes a big difference. Because yeah. watch, being content will keep momentum going, while being, being, uh, being complacent will stop all momentum. I, I, I'll give you a life example because you are staring at me right now. Let me, let, me, let me break it down for us. I can be content in my marriage and yet still desire for it to be better. Yeah. I, can, I can be happily married and yet still have a dream and say, but, but I would love to see this one day or I would love our relationship to look like this. I, I can be content in my financial situation and yet still desire for more. I can be content with how my kids are acting or how my kids are growing up and yet still have dreams for them, right? But I can be complacent in all of those things of my life and it will cause me to not desire anymore. And it will cause me to get stale as a parent. It'll cause me to get stale as a husband, as a wife. See, I can... In contentment, watch this. When I'm content, I'll say it's good, but is it the best? Talk to me this morning. And when I'm complacent, I'll say it's good, and it's not as bad as what it used to be. You see the difference? I, I, in content, I can say, okay, I'm good, I'm at peace, but is it everything God has for me? And being complacent, I'm saying, yeah, it's good, but it's not as bad as what it used to be. I'm okay. You see the mindset shift. Being content will, will give room for dreams and visions to grow more. Being content will, will give room for us to continue to, to dream big things. Why is it in 2020 we're going to unveil some things that is going to blow your socks off? I know sometimes people, as we begin to talk, they're like, yeah, but we got a good thing going on right now. Why not just settle? I mean, we got five locations. Got some staff. They work hard. Got some volunteers. They do, why do we need to, we want to plant another church? We want to plant two more churches? We want to build more stuff? Like what? Because yeah. when you're content, right, yes, you're satisfied, but you have a desire for more of the things of God. You have a desire for God to do more in your life. And, and being complacent, it'll just cause vision and dreams to die. Yeah, that's good. 
well, I mean, we could just settle. I mean, I mean, remember, it used to be that bad, and it's not as bad as that anymore. So, I mean, I mean, I'm not, I mean, my marriage is okay. I mean, I mean, it was worse. Like two years ago, woo, you should have saw us. I mean, we're okay now. Complacent. Yeah. And, and I think, watch this. Old age, it's not an age, it's a mentality. Like, old is it's not a number. I've, I've met 35-year-olds that they act like they're 80. I've met 80-year-olds, they act like they're 30 because of their mentality. Pastor John, I told him I was going to use him in my sermon. He done messed up. Thursday, we're hanging out. We was running some errands. And, and Friday night, I don't know if y'all know, but the Valparaiso Vikings, they had a semi-state football game. And, and my brother-in-law is in town. He's a big football fan. And my other brother-in-law who lives here, we're like, hey, man, let's go hang out. Let's go watch a football game. And Pastor John has a cousin on the team, really good running back. I said, Pastor John, we're going to go to the game Friday night. Why don't you go? He's like, man, you know how cold it's going to be Friday night? And I was like, are you kidding me right now? He's like, it's going to be so cold. Look, he just walked in the building at the perfect time. He goes, it's going to be so cold. He goes, then I'm going to sit in the stands, and I'm going to have to squint. I can't even hardly see the football field because I need glasses, and I don't want to wear my glasses. And then you know how many people is going to be there? It's a semi-state game. I looked at him. I said, do you know how old you sound right now? I was like, we're talking about going to a semi-state football game. I told him, I said, you making the message. He's like, please don't use it. I was like, oh, I'm using that all day. Then use it in the first service. And listen, don't look now. Don't laugh at him too hard. We do the same things in our life spiritually. I mean, if we start to dream, that means we got to have, we got to have more volunteers. I mean, if we start to build, that means financially, maybe, maybe we'll have to go ask for people to dig in a little bit deeper or maybe ask for people to actually just be a good tither. I mean, we got we to gotta do all of this stuff. Do we hear what we sound like sometimes? I mean, if I want my marriage to be healthy, it means well, I, I got to actually have a date night every now and then. I got to talk to my wife. I got to actually hang out with my kids to be a good parent. Old age is a mentality. And, and Moses found himself, y'all are staring at me, so I got to keep going. I must be in your business for a second. Well, Moses found out something, though. I think what gets us through the middle and keeps us going and keeps us from getting stale, you know what it is that will help us not stop in the middle? It's this word that is so much easier to say than to live. It's commitment. It's commitment. It's a commitment to work on my marriage day after day. It's a commitment to work on my parenting skills day after day. It's a commitment to pray, and even though the prayer hasn't been pray, uh, answered yet, that I go back and I pray again. It, it takes commitment, right, to those things. Because you know why I think commitment is not fun? You know why I think it? It's because life can sometimes be a grind. Come on, you ever had to just grind something out? You ever had to pray and then pray again? You ever had to pray and then pray again? You, you ever had to discipline your kid and then discipline the same thing over and over again 55 times and you wonder if they ever got it and they didn't get it because they keep doing it again? It's a grind. And this is what I've come to learn in my life. We was talking about this a couple days and our staff we was hanging out. You know what I've come to learn? Not everybody loves the grind. I don't know. I'm weird. We're, I, th I think our staff is weird. For whatever reason, we, we enjoy the grind, those tough moments. You know why people don't enjoy the grind? Because it's, it's in those moments in our life that sometimes God's trying to get rid of some stuff that shouldn't be there. Sometimes the grind is not external. I didn't say this in the first service, so maybe it's for you somewhere. Maybe you're watching. Sometimes the grind is not for the external things, but it's the grind is for the internal and the spiritual and the emotional and the mental that maybe God is trying to get rid of something in our life first. And it's in those moments that we have to stay committed, right? Pastor said this a while back, and we talk about this. The great expectation of a person's salvation is transformation. It's that grind. Am I different today than what I was yesterday? Not am I perfect today, but am I different today? Not even am I better today. Because Jesus Christ did not die for me to be better. He died for me to be different. Come on. Yeah. So it's am I different today than what I was yesterday? Am I different this month than what? Does my marriage look different today? And I think many times, honestly, if we can be real, we're family. Many times it's the fear of the grind that keeps us from being committed. It's the fear of the grind in marriage. I don't know if I can grind this out anymore. Wow. It's the fear of the grind of raising kids. It's the fear of the grind of giving and being a good steward with my tithe, with my temple, with my talent, with my testimony. With my treasure, I don't know if I can do this anymore, Pastor. I'm praying this prayer, and, and I don't seem like anything is happening. That's why Jesus said in Luke 18 and 1, he looked at his disciples. He said, listen, you've got to learn how to pray and not give up. 
He says, sometimes you got to grind. Thank God for those moments in my life that I've prayed a prayer and instantly and miraculously things have happened. But more often than not, I have come to understand that I have to go to my knees time and time after again and I have to ask those big things of God time and time after again. And I have to be willing to grab a hold of those things and not let go. I have to be willing to cry out to God for those things in my life and not let go. And it's in those moments, it's when I'm in the middle that the grind seems to get tough. It's not as bad as what it used to be, but it's not as good as what it could be. See, the problem Moses was showing the nation of Israel, Moses is reminding us today, the problem wasn't the promise that God had for the nation of Israel, or, or, or the problem wasn't even God itself. The problem was the hearts of the people. What got the nation of Israel in trouble was oftentimes when they, they failed to stay committed to what God had called them to do. It wasn't that God couldn't do it. It wasn't that God wasn't able to do it. And oftentimes in my life, let me talk to myself because y'all are looking at me all hard today. So let me talk to myself for a second. A, a lot of times in my life, the promises of God are not experienced in my life. Not because God wasn't isn't omnipotent and doesn't have the power to do it, but it's because I wasn't obedient to see it through. Because I stopped in the middle. I got complacent in the middle. Let me give you some things. Maybe this will cheer you up a little bit this morning. Well, what does it look like then? Because again, it's this commitment. It's this willingness to be in the middle and to not let go. 71 years this church has a great history. 19 years that Pastor and Sister Ron has been here, a great move of God has been happening. But what does it look like? Even in your own personal life, you find yourself in the middle. What, what does it look like to be committed? It's not as bad as what it used to be, but it's not a, even close to what God has for me. Here, here's the first thing. I want you to write this down. The effect of commitment looks like this. No compromise in who I serve. Because watch what Moses says. He says, so if you faithfully obey the commands I am giving you today... To love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. He says you're stuck in the middle. You're not in Egypt anymore. You're not in Canaan yet. You don't have the promised land. Just as Moses giving his farewell, he's not going to go with them. He says the very first thing I can say to you today, he says, is don't have a compromise in who you serve. Yeah. Now watch this. They know that there's about to be some battles fought. They're about to go possess the land that God has promised them. Surely they know there's going to be some battles. Surely they know that there's going to be a war. And look at this. Moses doesn't go about teaching them the art of war. Moses doesn't say, hey, listen, guys, first things first, let me just show you how we're going to line up when it's time to battle. That's not what he says. Moses doesn't call out some of the best woodworking people out of the tribe of Israel. Says, hey guys, hey, come on up. I want you to build me the best bow and arrow we got. Uh, we're going to teach everybody how to build a bow and arrow because there's going to be a lot of battles we got to face. And, and we're going to have to go to war. We're going to need some weapons of war. Now, Moses didn't bring back um, out the best blacksmith and say, we're going to build the best sword. Look, he didn't do none of that. He didn't, he didn't teach the nation of Israel anything about the art of war. He says, I'm going to show you how to go in and possess the land. Watch. I'm going to show you how you get the promise. He said, this is how you do it. You keep the main person, the main purpose, the main person. You don't have a compromise in who you serve. Yeah. Amen. He said, that is going to be your number one weapon in battle. And oftentimes we get ourselves in trouble because we go to battle with the wrong weapons. Oh, we try to go to battle with complaining to God. Well, I mean, I wish you would have done this two months ago for me. Come on, you ever complain? Y'all so saved this morning. Y'all ain't never done this before, have you? We try to complain to God. I mean, I wish, I mean, if my wife, if she would act different, our marriage could be different anyways. I've been praying for her for a while. I don't know why you haven't saved her yet. My wife's saved. Don't worry about it. I'll just use that as an analogy. I don't know. I've been praying for my kids, God, and it seems like my kids are acting crazy. I've been giving financially, God. I've been getting on the serving team, God, and it seems like I'm just more tired. And we complain as if that's going to do something. Or we compare, right? Well, my marriage is better than their marriage. I mean, don't you remember what they looked like two months ago? I mean, I go to church more than they do. I mean, I give financially. I saw the offering bucket go by. They didn't even give one of them I gave cards, God. And I gave financially, and you ain't doing nothing for me. 
just comparing, right? And, and, and look at what Moses does. Again, go back. He, he says, look, he says, I want to remind you, don't have a compromise in who you serve. He said, keep the commandments. He said, keep those things that are true. You need to learn how to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And Jesus, he would reference that in the New Testament when someone asked him, what's the most important thing? He says, you got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Watch this. Moses was going to show them. He says, I'm not going to show you how to fight. I'm going to teach you how to follow through. And, and don't we need that in our lives? And the, the problem that I find myself getting into is not that I don't know how to fight. I don't know how to follow through sometimes. I don't know how to stay obedient to God. I don't know how to carry out his commands on my life. I don't, I don't know how to, to, to submit my life to him. Oh, I'll do it on Sunday, but on Monday through Saturday. And Moses says, listen, for you in order to inherit the land, he said there cannot be no compromise in who you serve. You've got to be willing to follow the Lord your God. You've got to be willing to surrender your life. And oftentimes we find ourselves compromising. Well, we don't do it out loud, but it's in our hearts. We find ourselves trying to please other people. We try to find ourselves trying to, trying to please other things in life, going after those things of life. Again, they could even be good things, but they're not the godly things in my life. Moses says, listen, first things first. He says, you, got, you can't have no compromise in who you serve. He said, if you're going to stay committed, man, you, you got to be in this thing the whole way. And then watch. Then he says this. He says, because you're committed the whole way, because there's not going to be no compromise to who you serve. He says, then when, when you have commitment, then there's no lack in his supply. Talking about God. Because yeah. God is telling Moses, he's telling the nation of Israel through Moses, this is what Moses says. He says, once you surrender. So watch. If you don't have total surrender, get this. I didn't say this in the first service. If you don't have total surrender, you don't even get to verse 14. The only way you get to verse 14 is total surrender to God. He says, then I will send rain on your land in its season, both autumn and spring rain, so that you may gather in your grain new wine and olive oil. I'll provide grass in the fields for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. Wow. Wow. So watch, he says, if you have no compromise in who you serve because you're fully going to surrender to God. He says, because of that, there's going to be no lack in his supply. Now, you got to understand the context. Again, if I can give you something, the nation of Israel, God is reminding them they're about to go inhabit a land that God knows all about it. God knows what's going on. And they're about to go inhabit a land that, that there's, this, there's this natural world view that is going to totally contradict what God is trying to teach them. If you study out history, it's, it's in the land of, Can uh, the land of, of Canaan. They had this religious belief, and they had this God. This God's name was Baal. Some of you might find that name familiar. And, and, and Baal was their storm god. Baal was the god in the land of Canaan that, that they worshipped. And they would offer up sacrifices to, to Baal, the storm god, because they thought and, and they believed that Baal controlled the rain. And Baal controlled the storms. And, and if you read the nation, of his, uh, the, the, nation, the nation of Israel, their history, many times what got them in trouble is once they got into the land, they started fallen away from Jehovah God and started serving the, the God of Baal. And, and we read like, like in 1 Kings, Elijah, the prophet Elijah, that's, that's that story we get the account in the Bible where he goes up on the mountain and he challenges the prophets of Baal. And they, they put a sacrifice and they pray for, for fire to come down from heaven, right? And, and, and so you got to remember, this is what, a, this is what a, um, the nation of Israel is about to walk into. So Moses said, listen, you got to surrender completely. And once you surrender completely, there's going to be unlimited supply to what you need. And the reason this is important as well, again, you got to remember, they're in the middle. They're not in Egypt anymore, but they're not in the promised land. Now, the important thing about Egypt, they came from a place in Egypt that was pretty good. Of course, it was in slavery, but the resources were pretty good. But what you got to understand about Egypt, the, the way they, re, they got their resources had to do with a lot of hard work. They had to dig trenches for water. Their main water source was the Nile River. So they had to dig trenches to get the Nile River to run to where they needed it to go. And if they ever had any issues with the, the trenches they dug, guess what? Their crops would fail. Or if they ever had any issues with the Nile River, guess what? Their crops would fail. And they had all of these things being supplied in their life. 
by outside resources. But if the outside resources failed, then they find themselves lacking. And don't we do that? We try to find our peace in other things. We try to find our joy in other things. We try to find fulfillment in other things. Relational needs met in, in, in other ways that God didn't intend it to be. Financial needs met in ways God didn't intend it to be. And we find ourselves, right? You ever found yourself being wore out because you're digging all these trenches? Trying to get to a resource that was never intended to be your resource? All right. Oh, that'll preach. And you wonder why you find yourself wore out? And you wonder why you find yourself tired. But, but, but what Egypt did, they knew how to do it well enough to have just enough. They had just enough. They, they had just enough water to water their crops. They had just enough water to have a good crop. They had just enough water to take care of the land. But God is showing the nation of Israel and is reminding you. He said, listen, you're coming from a place of just enough. I'm about to take you a place of plenty. I'm about to take you to a place where you don't have to dig trenches to get the resource. You don't have to dig trenches to get the water. You don't have to put in manual labor for the supply that I have. Because the supply that I have is going to come down from heaven above. The supply that I have for you, there is no lack. There is no shortage. There is nothing that anyone can do to stop what I have for you. He said it's only going to be contingent on your obedience. And listen, again, in my life, sometimes I have to remind myself, I have to remind myself, am I being obedient to God? Because anytime I'm obedient to God, his supply is unlimited in my life. So Moses tells him, he says, listen, he says, there's going to be no, no lack in your supply. Again, it's, it's a spiritual blessing that we have available today. Ephesians 1, it says, Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Everything we ask for. As we look at 2020, as we begin to pray these prayers, everything that we pray, every prayer that you're praying for your lost kid, every prayer that you're praying for your life, every prayer that we're praying for our cities and our communities and our church, every thing God has wow. available for us. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Moses says, listen, I'm going to show you something. He says, you don't, you're not going to claim this promise by looking at it and studying the map and viewing it from afar and saying, oh, that's pretty. One day, he says, no, no, it's not how we're going to get this land. Some of you, you come in this morning, you're in the middle some things in your life, and you're looking at the promise. You know, you know the things. We've been preaching about it all year. You know what God promises over your life. You know what pro God promises over your marriage. You know what God promises over, over our city. And you're looking at it from a distance. You're like, oh, that's, that's cool. Maybe one day. Maybe one day I'll have that in my marriage. Maybe one day I'll have that in my family. Maybe, you know, one day I, I can be emotionally whole. Maybe one day I'll be able to forgive. Moses is like, listen, you, you don't get to the promised land just by looking at it and dreaming about it. He says, I'm going to show you how we're about to step out in faith and go take yeah. it. Amen. He says, I'm, I'm going to show you how, how we go after what God has for you and I. Because why? Because we're not going to stop in the middle. And then he says, the third thing he gives to us, watch this. He says, there's no laziness in my work. Oh, hold up, Moses. You done lost me. I came out of a land of Egypt where I had to work all the time. And uh, you, you told me I had to surrender. All right, I, I get it. I got to keep God first. And his supply, his rain is going to come down. And it's going to water the fields. I'm going to have plenty of crops. But watch this. Then he finished. You got to finish the verse. He says, so that you may gather in your grain new wine and olive oil. Hold up. I thought God was going to bring it in for me. I thought God was going to do all the work. I mean, in Egypt, I had, to, I had to work hard there. And you're telling me now to the promise that I get to, there's going to be some work there as well. Oh, there's going to be some work. It's going to be a different kind of work. Jesus says you can take up my yoke because my yoke is easy and it's light. Yeah. But guess what? It's still a yoke. I don't know if you know what a yoke represents. It represents you go out to plow it sometimes. You go out to dig. You go out to work. And, and this is our problem. This is, this is where I, I find myself in trouble. Is that the hardest time to stay disciplined is when I can actually see the promise God has for me. The hardest time to stay disciplined, dare I say, is when I even step in and get to experience it a little bit. Oh, this is great. 
I prayed a couple of prayers, and God, God, God's doing a little bit. I'm like, my kids ain't acting too crazy. I mean, they still a little bit of crazy, but not as crazy as what they used to be. I mean, my marriage is a little bit different, but, but, but I mean, it's not the best, but, but it's, not, it's, it's not as what it could be. It, it's, it's where we come back, what I talked to you earlier. It's about that grind, no laziness in my work. That's the hardest time to be disciplined. It's when I've almost got the win. When I'm in the middle and I can see it, it's almost there, but I got to go get it. I coach a seventh grade middle school basketball team, boys. Not girls, they couldn't take all my screaming, but boys. Some of the girls, they practiced with us the other day. They said, would you come coach our basketball team? And I'm like, bless your heart. No, I can't. I can't do that. I said, you'll hate me. Don't do it. Um, but, I, but I coach boys. And it was our second, I think it was our second game of the season. It might have been our first. We've been practicing hard. They've been working hard. They've been doing everything I'm asking in practice. And, and we come out, and, man, they play out their minds, man. I mean, they're just moving the ball. They're making curl cuts. They're cutting back door. Those of you who don't know basketball, it's like, what he's saying? They're just doing good stuff. All right, it looks good. Ball movement is great. We're making layups, right? And we're, we're and this team, this team that we played, I kid you not, I wanted to see their birth certificate because they had two dudes on there. I would have swore they was 28 years old in seventh grade. I don't know. They were tall. I'm not, I kid you not. One of them, I'm not joking, was 6'4", I think, and the other one was 6'2". And the tallest guy on my team is not even close to that. But so they're playing great. And we're up 10 points with a minute 20 to go. 10 points in a seventh grade basketball team with no shot clock means we don't have to hurry with, with a minute 20 to go. And I saw the look in their eye. I don't know if y'all have ever seen I saw the look in their eye. They looked at the scoreboard and I saw it and I knew it. So I called the timeout and I called them over. I was like, listen, we're up 10 points with a minute 20. It does not mean the game is over. I was like, I see you looking at the scoreboard. I know we're winning. But the game is not finished. And, and I don't want to throw my mother-in-law under the bus because I think it's her fault. Because she looked at my wife at the time. She goes, why is he freaking out? They're up 10 with a minute and 20. What could go wrong? Oh, it went wrong. Let me tell you. It went wrong. In a matter of 30 seconds, we're only up two points. How it even happened, I still cannot phantom in my imagination how this happened. But in a matter of 30 seconds, we're only up two points. Now, we end up winning the game. It was a good coaching moment in my, in my boy's life. Because I, I was able to talk to them, and I know what you're doing is you're probably judging them harshly right now because they're like, why would you quit with a minute 20 on the scoreboard? Well, don't look now because we do it often in our life as well. Come on. Come on. We find ourselves in a place where we're up. Right? We find ourselves in a place where, you know, it's not as bad as what it used to be. It's not as good as what it could be. But, I mean, I mean we're winning. Why, why do I need to work hard right now? I mean, my family is pretty good. Why, why should I keep praying? I mean, our city is, it's okay. I mean, our church is growing. We get new people. And, and so why should we keep praying? Why do we need to keep growing? Why do we need to keep adding services? Why do we need to do all of this stuff? Why do, why do I need to get on a service team? I mean, it looks like everything's getting done around here. Why do I need to make a difference when I go into my workplace? Because I got a couple saved friends. All right. Don't get quiet on me. We often find ourselves, right, we're standing in a place where we can see the promises of God. And even for some of us this morning, we're standing in a place where we even experience some of the promises of God. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, I've come to challenge you this morning, is don't get lazy with your work. Yeah, the game is not over. Yeah. The game is not finished. Listen, there is still time on the clock, and we have an enemy. We have an adversary that is wanting to keep the promises of God from us, from our life. We have an imminent enemy and an adversary that wants you to not impact that place when you go to work. You have an enemy and an adversary that would love to just see your kids do better but not have life change. But I've come to tell you, listen, it is time to put your hands to the shovel. It is time to put your hands to the plow that there is still a work. Yes, God is sending supply. But guess what? There's still a work we got to do. There's still things that require of us. And the natural tendency for us, hear me this morning, I'm talking to the church people now. If you don't know Christ, this ain't for you yet. But the natural tendency for us, you're watching online, th those people at our locations, the natural tendency for us as Christ followers is we get close and we experience a little bit of a win and we get close to the promises of God and, and, and yes, we find ourselves in the middle and it's not as bad as what it used to be but it couldn't, it's not as good as what it could be and the natural tendency is we're like, well let's just, let's just let off the gas. Yeah. I mean, there's no need for us to keep dreaming. There's no need for us to keep adding teams. 
There's no need for us to have more volunteers. I mean, let's just let off the gas. Let's just put it in coast mode. Let's just, dare I say, get complacent. Moses says, listen, you're about, you're about to be in a place. And just because you stand in the promised land doesn't mean you sit down and relax. Just because you inherit what God has promised you. Listen, I, I, I know how to be content. I know how to relax and have fun. But I also know that God has more for my life. I also know God has more for this church, for our city, for our locations. I know. And, and I think for me, again, I'm going to talk to myself so you don't get offended. I, I think for me, again, it's in that moment. I said it earlier, but it's in these moments of life where I get to a point where I don't receive everything God has for you. Not because he's not omnipotent and can't do it, but because I haven't been obedient and kept my hand to the plow. Right. Become lazy. Moses says you can't have any laziness in your work. And watch this. Here's number four. Come on, Lindsay. Come on, worship team. He says don't have any. There's no forgetfulness from my past. Could look at verse 18. He says, fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your forehead. He says, don't have any forgetfulness. Again, they're in, they're, they're in the middle. And Moses is saying, don't stop in the middle. I know you're not in Egypt. You're not in slavery anymore. It's not as bad as what it used to be. But he's saying, but look over there. That's the promised land. That's everything God says we can have. And it, it would be so easy for us to get complacent. It would be for, so easy for us to say, let's just stop here. But Moses says, I don't want you to forget what God has brought you from. I don't want you to forget the stories. What got the nation of Israel in trouble oftentimes is they forgot. The Bible says at one point in time there was a generation that rose up that neither knew God nor his works. Why? Because they stopped telling the stories. They forgot what God had brought them from. And they forgot what God wanted to take them to. And I, and I think sometimes that's where the disconnect is in my life. I'm good at remembering where he brought me from. I can celebrate my past. I can celebrate. I remember God used to have me here, but I, get, I stop in the middle because I stopped remembering, but he said I can have this. I, I remember, church, seven, been in here 71 years. I remember when there used to be 20 or 30 people. I remember that. But I forgot. He said I could have 10% of our city. I, I, I remember when there was just one location. But I forgot. He said, no. I don't just want three or four or five. I want six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I don't know how many. I want more locations. I remember when all my kids were unsaved. Now, now I got one coming. But I forgot. No, he said my whole household can be saved. Right? He said don't forget the things that God's done in your life. Don't, don't forget those lessons. Don't forget what he's done. For you and I, sometimes even we're ashamed, we're ashamed, to, and we're like, yeah, but if I, if I start to celebrate, and if I start to, to, you know, Pastor Phil mentioned this hashtag we're going to start in 2020 so we can start to share the stories of what God is doing, and I know what's going to happen. Instantly, some of you are going to say, I don't want to share that because I don't really want people to know what I'm praying about. I don't want them to know how messed up my family may be. I don't want them to know the issues that I'm going from. Who cares? Half the time people know it anyways. You're going to put it on social media anyways. You might as well celebrate what God's doing. Don't be ashamed of that. We're, we're not ashamed of our dysfunction. Let's not be ashamed of the celebration that God wants us to have when he starts moving in our life. He says, you got to be able to remember. And watch this. Come on, I want you to stand. He said, since there's no forgetfulness from your past, get, you got to get it, get it. Don't miss it. Israel's in the middle. Today you're in the middle financially, emotionally, spiritually. You're standing in the middle of your family. It's not as bad as what it used to be, but is it everything God has for you? And now watch. He says, you got to surrender. 
you, you got to surrender. You got to commit to God totally because you're going to surrender. There's going to be no lack in his supply. He's going to send down the rain. It's not going to be bail. You're not going to dig trenches at a ditch. And he said, but there's no lack in his supply. That doesn't mean that you get lazy because you're going to have to do some work. You got to bring in the harvest. And he says, don't forget the past. And now watch this. Because you do that, because you stay committed, because you stay committed, because you don't quit, because you don't get complacent, because you do say, I do want everything that God has for me. Now watch. He said, there's no limit to where you go. <laughs> He said, there's no limit to where you can go. I know you're standing in the middle this morning. You may have come out of Egypt, and maybe it's not as bad as what it used to be. But it's not everything that God has for you. And Moses says, watch this. In Deuteronomy, because he goes on in chapter 11 and 24, he says, every place you set your feet, your foot. Come on, everybody say it. Every place. Come on, say it. No, you got to say it like you meant it. Every place. Every place you set your foot when you go out on Monday. When you go into that workplace, every place you set your foot, every kid that you're praying for, that place when you walk into that high school and you walk down that hallway, every place will be yours. Every place you set your foot financially, it can be yours. Every place you set your foot emotionally, it can be yours. Your territory will expand. Come on, anybody needs some territory expanded? Come on, anybody needs some enlargement in their life? Anybody needs some spiritual enlargement in their life? Moses says every place you set your foot, your territory is going to expand. He says if you don't stop in the middle, and I know what you're thinking, but he was talking to Israel. He was talking to them. Oh, but we have the inheritance as well because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Because can I show you? One day he hung, and where did he hang? You know it. He hung in the middle between two thieves. He stopped in the middle, so you and I didn't have to stop in the middle. He went to a place in his life, and he surrendered, and he stretched out his arms on a cross, and he said, everything that I have, I now give to you. He said, everything you lose is going to be loose. Everything you find is going to be found. He says, every place you go through Christ Jesus, God's promises are what? They are yes and amen. Now, come on, can you put your hands together? Can you give God a praise? Come on, he's extending our territory. He's extending your territory. Hey guys, what an incredible message we were just a part of about the promises of God. We pray and we hope that it wasn't just something that we just sat through and something that we experienced, but it's something that God's going to be able to do something big in our lives moving forward. Uh, we just ask, if it was a blessing to you, we just feel free to share that. Share that video on social media, email it, just send it out. We would love it if God can move just beyond uh, this moment and in this message. Again, if you have a prayer request, you have a prayer need, we invite you, email us at pastorphil at hcc3d.com. We would love to be praying with you no matter what it is, no matter what you're going through, and we'd love to celebrate with you as well as you have anything to celebrate with. Um, we look forward to seeing you again at our iCampus, at one of our locations, at any of our locations. Be blessed.